for this retreat, being the living and dying with awareness. And we, also, we already mentioned a few things about that uh, last night. But <clears throat> there's many uh, levels to living and also some different levels to dying. Uh, and in the ordinary life, or for the ordinary person, you say life and death, then they think it means uh, the life of this physical body. And then when it uh, dies, that's uh, death. And whatever they might believe uh, happens uh, after uh, death, uh, you know, that's another issue whether they believe life continues or not. But uh, <clears throat> so on the ordinary level, you know, the life in the physical body, uh, you know, we're born uh, even before that, even at the moment of conception, you could say life begins, you know, when the mother and father contribute their X and Y chromosomes and the little one cell organism is born. At the same time, uh, consciousness, which you could uh, regard as sort of the electric spark, uh, also comes together with that uh, uh, new organism and you know, it grows for nine months in the womb, and especially according to the Buddhist uh, understanding. It's that spark of consciousness that actually uh, governs the development of that fetus. And if that spark of consciousness is not able to remain in that uh, developing embryo for one reason or another, then uh, you know, a miscarriage uh, would happen or some other, you know, the, the death of that uh, would occur. And of course, this is a little bit contrary or, you know, to Western science belief uh, that they don't have this idea that of some, you know, consciousness coming from outside, you know, becomes uh, impregnated in that embryo and, uh, and governs the uh, development of that or uh, is the energy behind that. Anyway, whatever. So after nine months, the baby's born, you know, then it lives, goes through life, so many years, although death could also happen. And sometimes death happens in the womb. It happens upon coming out of the womb. And every second, you can probably find uh, recordings that every second from one second after birth, to five seconds, 10 seconds, uh, one day and 23 seconds, and up to 102 years and 37 minutes and 57 seconds. 
a death has occurred at every, uh, you know, uh, you know, second uh, period of that time for many different uh, reasons. But anyway, so uh, the birth and death of the physical life. But uh, according in, in, in that life, we create a lot of karma. And there are our actions and the way that we live, think and believe is what's also going to can contribute to that living process and also uh, death. And as I mentioned in that uh, Dhammapada verse, that mindfulness is the path to the deathless. Unmindfulness is the path to death. The mindful do not die. And the unmindful are as if dead already. So, you know, in this, uh, what we call conditioned life, that the you know, the way we live also uh, determines how much we are going to uh, suffer and how long our life will uh, live. Because if we live an unmindful life, and we do a lot of uh, unskillful uh, actions, or we live out of harmony with the laws of nature, then we could uh, prematurely, you know, cause death to this being, because as you know, the average, let's say the average lifespan of the human body, you know, nowadays, I don't know what they say, 70 years old or something like that, but we know that people uh, die even when they're uh, young, and some people live older than that. And that all depends on the, the accumulation of uh, the karma. And that has a lot to do with uh, our mind. And there's two, two aspects of the life, as I've already mentioned also, with the living process is the physical life of the body. Uh, in terms of the heart beating, the blood circulating, the digestive system and all the, uh, the cells and of the body that are uh, working under the skin uh, causing the growth of this body and the life to go on and again we're hardly ever uh, aware of that so there's the inner life and then there's the outer life as i already mentioned so outer living we're aware of our arms and you know body doing uh, things but then there's the inner life underneath the skin that we don't know much about. And then also uh, the mind. That our mind has a sort of an external activity and an internal activity. So we're aware of our mind in terms of just when we get angry, okay, we're aware of this uh, anger that arises in the mind, or we're aware of happiness that arises. There's some other emotional states. Or we're aware of our different thoughts, worry, anxiety, fear, Only but when they manifest, but we're aware, we're unaware of the subtler workings of our mind and consciousness. Uh, so you could call that the, you know, external life and then the inner uh, life. <clears throat> and knowing how to live, you know, this body and mind also is governed uh, so uh, by the, the laws of nature. There's certain laws of nature that govern the uh, our the way that we act and live and whether we're going to experience suffering or happiness 
and as most of you know, the law of nature is expressed in the, the Dhammapada verses, all, all phenomena or all actions are led by the mind. Mind is their master, mind is their maker. If one acts or speaks with an impure mind, then suffering will follow as the cartwheel follows the foot of the ox. And in the same way, if one acts or speaks with a pure state of mind, then happiness, comfort and happiness will follow as your shadow follows you around. So this embodies the, the law of karma. Uh, and it also is similar to the natural law of gravity if you throw something up, what happens? Comes down. Sometimes with a big thud, right? So in the same way, the law of gravity is similar to the law of karma. If you throw something out of your mouth, those vibrations go out in the world mingle into other people's bodies and minds and can produce some reaction in them that then comes back to us as in the Newton's law, an equal and opposite reaction. So actually the law of karma is is very similar to these natural laws that we read about in our mathematics books and, and so on. So the law of gravity and the, the Newton's law. So why do people accept Newton's law? Well, they, they said, well, he did some experiments. And he saw this. So just because of that, everyone accepts that. But when the Buddha says the law of karma, people says, prove it, prove it. We're proving it all the time in the results of our actions. Uh, so if we act with a pure state of mind, means acting out of uh, uh, thoughts of non-attachment, non-hatred, and uh, non-delusion. Whereas the, the actions of an impure mind are, are considered to be like the self-centered uh, greed. That means just wanting to get stuff, things that satisfy the one uh, sensual desire. So this kind of greed and then the opposite is anger or aversion. And anger and aversion comes from the greed. Because just examine any time you are angry or don't like something, want to get away from something, uh, what is the reason of that? It's because in some way, it threatens our uh, whatever we're attached to. You know, it threatens our material possessions if somebody you know, threatens to steal something. Or if they insult us, we're attached to our self-image and somebody comes by and you know, insults us. So we get angry because it's threatening something that we're attached to, that we're holding on to. And then ignorance is considered to be, you know, the sense of uh, self or, but especially not understanding the nature of the mind and not understanding the, the law of karma, but more importantly, not understanding how this uh, mind works, not understanding what uh, the life process is. So, anyway, so this uh, you know, law of karma being a, is uh, 
how we live in harmony with nature. If we act or speak with a pure state of mind, then comfort and happiness follows us like our shadow. So we live in harmony with the laws of, of nature. But most people live out of harmony with the laws of nature. Uh, and some other of these laws of nature are impermanence. So that everything in the conditioned world is in a constant state of flux and change. These physical bodies, I mean, look at, from the moment of conception, this body went from a one cell organism to a multi-billion cell organism in the space of nine months. That's a lot of change going on in it. And then after it was born, it, it keeps on changing because of the growth process up to 40 years and it starts changing going down the hill. So there's never a, a moment when this body isn't changing. Although we don't normally notice that because those changes are happening on a cellular level and so on. <clears throat> so the process of change, not only this body, but everything in the world too. And if we, if we don't accept that change, or we try to uh, stop it, then that's when uh, we suffer. Uh, and if we living out of harmony with the, the laws of nature, uh, and especially that's in terms of the, because all, you know, breaking the precepts or living out of harmony, it, it's, uh, it's kind of in, embodied by the, the precepts about refraining from killing or stealing or sexual misconduct or lying or intoxicating uh, the mind. So these are all things that are sort of out of harmony with the laws of nature. Uh, and that means also being the, the pre in, the, in the present moment. So anyways, because people, you know, don't, are not taught about uh, what life really is in the life process, and especially of these laws of nature, because of greed, hatred, and delusion, they live outside of the laws of nature. That means they uh, also are clinging to their sense of self and develop this greed and uh, aversion that infringes on other people's uh, lives. And that's what brings so much uh, suffering. So anyway, we live unmindfully. And not understanding how your body lives, we might eat and do things uh, that harm this body unmindfully. And it could produce a premature death. So that's one of the meanings of, you know, uh, unmindfulness is the path to death. Because if you're un, unmindful, and un, unmindfulness means not being grounded in the present moment, being uh, led by the, the past and the future, not being relaxed and centered in the present uh, moment, uh, being aware of our intentions. So we do something unmindfully. That means your mind wasn't totally present when you were doing the action because you were focused on the result or you were being pushed by an emotion that has its roots in the past as well. So we're not fully awake and grounded in the present uh, moment. So we uh, get caught up into these type of uh, unskillful behaviors. And also we keep repeating our habits. And the, by not understanding the, the nature of the mind, people you know, become addicted to things. 
and just the 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 repetition of our habits, which are largely motivated by a pleasurable and painful feeling. And, and I usually give this little example actually about how, how our habits and so on have been, uh, you know, accumulated, you know, ever since birth or even before that. So when the, when the baby's born, of, you know, basically for nine months being in the womb, the body and mind were basically at one. Because as I mentioned before, at the moment of conception, the spark of consciousness gets embedded in that, uh, you know, embroil. And it develops, you know, for the whole nine months that consciousness was, you know, intimately interconnected. And, you know, that one cell organism divided into two because of cell division, it kept dividing. And every time the cell divided, the consciousness also went into the new cell. And so essentially every cell of the body has a kind of consciousness or awareness, not the kind that we uh, normally think of, but uh, basically it's the life force, that uh, awareness. But anyway, it's, uh, you know, every cell of our body has that awareness and they're all interconnected. And for nine months, that's all the mind knew was that energy, tremendous energy going into this development of the baby. And it was occurring primarily in the present moment. And when the baby is born, according to, you know, the child developmental psychologists, or even your mothers probably can attest to that, that the the child is basically born, his, the mind is in the present moment. You know, it comes out and all of a sudden there's a new world around and, you know, it doesn't really have any formulated thoughts. And it's just, there's this, what is called oceanic awareness. If you ever looked into a baby's eyes and so on, you can probably, you, know, you could uh, you know, get a sense of that. Sure, it may feel pain and so on, uh, and you know, it gets spanked by the doctor and it might you know, cry or other things, but those are just instinctual uh, reactions. But basically the baby doesn't have thoughts of the past or future really. Uh, and it's what uh, uh, is called oceanic awareness. It means a very expanded awareness. It doesn't even have the sense of it has a body. They may put the baby on the mother's abdomen after birth, but it wouldn't even know the difference between its body or the mother's body, or even have an idea of what a, anything, what a body even is. And so, but shortly after that, especially, you know, they give the baby to, a, you know, we have to give the baby a name, right? And they call it little Johnny, little Susie. And all the relatives come over to hold it. You know, and goochie, goochie, goo, tickling the stomach. <laughs> so now this, what used to be oceanic awareness, now it's getting all this attention is coming to it, you know. All these people are coming to hold it and look at it and start calling its name and and so on. So little by little, what used to be a very expanded oceanic awareness without any kind of self-identity or even body identity, it gets kind of coagulates and, and uh, forms a kind of a nucleus in, in the mind of a, of a center, of a me. 
with all this attention that's constantly giving to it. And then when they start calling its name, little by little, it starts you know, looking. Because somehow now there's an identification of a name with this thing. But all that takes time, but on all that has helped occurring on a sort of a cellular level, electromagnetic, you know, vibrations and so on that are generated by repetition. And as the baby keeps growing, it, you know, again, his mind is mostly in the present moment. And it hasn't formed really likes or dislikes. But then, what happens? The Achi comes. The sweet grandmother comes over and gives the baby its first chocolate. And then the baby tastes that chocolate and gets a sweet sensation. They might, you know, smile. And then the desire arises. And then it starts to associate the face of the grandmother with a pleasant feeling. And then maybe the uncle picks up the baby and squeezes it a little too hard and causes it some pain. And then the baby identifies the face of the uncle with the unpleasant or painful feeling. And, you know, the mind of a baby is like a sponge, you know, and it just soaks up everything. And then it starts to, you know, this pleasure and pain is born then. It starts to identify certain things bring a pleasurable feeling and other things bring a painful feeling. And then it starts to hope that the grandmother will come again in the future, expecting a pleasurable sensation. And usually that happens because the grandmother comes and, you know, the boys bring <laughs> gifts and, and so on. And then what caused it pain, it's hoping that that won't come again in the future. So that is how the the past and the future gets created in the mind of a, of a baby. It's based on the pleasurable and painful uh, sensations. And so it develops this desire and aversion for pleasurable feelings and the aversion and dislike for painful feelings. And then it keeps on uh, growing. Whether a cat, you know, walks by and a baby grabs the cat's tail and the cat turns around and scratch. And the baby got the baby got the pain. And then it starts to fear the, the cat. And so on. So all of that uh, keeps going. And then the baby starts to focus externally. Before there wasn't any idea of inside or outside, there was just this very vast oceanic awareness. But then once that awareness has been centered behind the eyes, this idea of inside and outside then becomes uh, cemented. And this is how the con conditioned mind, this is called the conditioned mind, because it was not something you were born with, is something that has been acquired through uh, just the process of, of evolution and the way evolution has occurred and, and the way people and societies have, uh, you know, learned to develop and, and regard the world. So, so anyway, the, the child then grows up and, uh, you know, it 
f- keeps on forming all these habits. And it, the connection to the body in the present moment gets gradually severed because now the child is starting to look outward through all the senses and is getting pleasurable, painful feelings through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and even its uh, mind as it you know grows older and older. But anyway, basically then this uh, this uh, dualistic consciousness uh, evolves and it loses the connection to the present moment. And everything starts, the experience is, is in terms of the past and the future. And all problems are problems of the past and the future. Try to think of any problem that you might have or had before or might have in the future that's not connected in one way or another to the past or the future. Because basically our, our conditioned life just, just depends on the memory. So whenever we experience something, even a smell, you know, you have an aversion to a certain smell or an attachment to a certain smell because you've, uh, you know, acted in, in that way in the past. And, you know, you, you have an unpleasant sensation on your face and so you want to get rid of it. So you reach up and you know, want to scratch. That's because there's an unpleasant feeling there that is blocking your desire for happiness, threatening your happiness. You want to sit there and meditate, and all of a sudden a strong pain comes. So that's threatening your desire just to, to sit still and have nothing bother you. But that's not the reality of the world, that the world is constantly changing and we can't control what is going on either inside of ourself or outside of ourself. But we, we try to control it. And so that's what I meant actually earlier by not living in harmony with the laws of nature. The laws of nature is saying that everything is changing. And if we try to uh, stop that change or fight it, then suffering arises. And even attachment, when you're attached to something and you want to hold on to it, right? you're living again, not in harmony with the laws of nature. The laws of nature saying it will change but we're trying to control things and act as they shouldn't change. I mean, we want things to change that we, we don't like, and we, we don't want things to change that we uh, do like. So we wish we'd have perfect health, but we see we can't uh, control that. Or, you know, we can't control others. We want to have our mate or our partner or whatever uh, to always, be the way you know we first experienced them when we fell in love or whatever but then they change and so we resist that change so anyway i'm just mentioning these things to highlight the the way that we've fell out of harmony with the laws of nature due to the laws of nature of impermanence and also of no self, and we'll talk more about uh, later. But because that's really the, the crux of the living process, the way that you live and the way that you die. So in this process of our life, even this uh, conditioned life, uh, you know, we are getting uh, uh, caught 
you know, into the, the web of cause and effect or the, the karmic web. When we say the karmic web, it means the, all of our memories and all of our, our past experiences and actions, our conscious actions, and the habits that we've accumulated, you know, they've, they've developed these very deep and sticky type of interconnections. And, you know, everything is really interconnected, our body and our mind, and all the different systems and so on uh, in our body that get affected by so many uh, things. You know, you all know that, you know, if you, you change something, it's bound to have an effect uh, somewhere else down the line. But again, most people live oblivious to that because they're driven by uh, greed and the future. So most people are not grounded in the present moment. And even when you're meditating, how many times in one meditation period were you thinking, when is this going to end? Anybody ever have any thoughts like that come in their mind? Or how many, you know, you wanted to sit in the present moment, but your, your mind was going to the past and going to the future and going like a pendulum swinging on a clock. And actually, that's what creates time. The pendulum swinging between past and future. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Mind is constantly going between the past and the future. Which creates the idea of time. Because we're not grounded in the present uh, moment. And we've lost that natural connection to the present moment. So the present moment awareness is really the natural state of our consciousness. And even the, the idea of past or present is created within the mind, is with that example of, of the baby. Uh, and it, it produces fear, anxiety, and worry of not getting what you want in the future or remembering the past and then not, wa not wanting that to come into the future. So you don't want some parts of your past to come into the future and you, and you want uh, some parts of that to carry on to the future. But again, uh, it's uh, largely beyond our control. I mean, to a certain extent, we might be able to control a certain amount of those things to a certain point. But uh, otherwise, uh, the reality of uh, sickness and death comes up to, to uh, crush those uh, ideas. Because again, old age sickness and death is a law of nature, anything that is born is bound to get sick, grow old, and die. But we do everything, we try to prevent the process of aging, or prevent getting sick. Of course, that's, that may be all right, especially preventing getting sick, but people do all kinds of things to prevent getting sick, but they wind up getting sick anyway. Because some of the things that they do to prevent getting sick cause other types of, of sickness. Uh, and to, you know, people have a lot of fear of pain. Pain is also a natural condition of, of life. And, but, you know, people have that fear of, of the pain, but pain is just, a, again, it's just a sensation. And so people are, you know, living in fear that the pain is going to come to you in the future. And that it doesn't allow you to live totally in the present moment. 
Anyway, so what I'm you know, trying to get at is that uh, because we've lost touch with the present moment, which is the natural state of the consciousness, we've been become caught in this, uh, the push and pull between pleasure and pain in the past and future. Those are called the dualities. Uh, there's many types of dualities. Uh, but the main ones are pleasure and pain. And then there's the past and the future. And then there's me and the other. So we call these the dualities. But again, they've been uh, more or less, you know, created by uh, the mind. And the life revolves around that. And you seek out pleasure and avoid pain, remembering the past, projecting the future, and the tension between myself and the others. But that's an artificial distinction. The, the self. But it, it is something been, we created since the time of the baby, as I mentioned. And it keeps on uh, growing. So it's that whole process. And then actually then when a person finally, you know, dies, the sum total of their mind up to that point, or you know, all the habits and, and so on that they've cultivated, you know, that's what's going to determine how they die as well. If they die with fear or a mind full of anger or full of, uh, you know, regret and guilt and worry for having lived an unskillful life or hurted uh, others, then that's going to also determine, you know, where the mind and go after uh, death because the mind is still caught in the past and the, in the future. So that's why actually in, you know, in meditation, the word meditation comes from the root word M-E-D-I. Does anybody know what that root M-E-D-I comes from? I don't know what it might say in the Oxford Dictionary or so, but uh, there are certain words with the with that root of M E D I, right? What comes to mind? Meditation. Okay, meditation. Another one. Medicine. Huh? Medicine. M E D I. Last time I spelled it. And mediation. Mediation? What does a mediator do? So this word M-E-D-I, although there might could be some other meanings of it, but the important ones the, in terms of our uh, practice, proof or how the word meditation came up, is to keep the mind in the middle. In the middle of those three dualities that I just had to mention. So medicine is a bridge between sickness and health. Is it? And a mediator, what does a mediator do? Tries to res resolve disputes amongst the warring parties. There was a famous example in the, in the time of the Buddha, where the Buddha's native clan and another clan, or even some of their relatives, they were fighting over water rights, which people even do to this day, but even back then. And they're about ready to go to blows and kill each other over 
is wanting to have control over the water. It flowed through the middle of their lens. And the Buddha stepped in and became the great mediator. He got right in the middle of them. You know, they had their swords drawn and were about ready to, you know, go cut each other's heads off. And the Buddha strode in, into the middle of them and talked common sense uh, to them. And they, you know, uh, of course, it was due to the Buddha's great uh, personality too and his uh, powerful aura and so on. But uh, anyway, he resolved that conflict. So, and so meditation. Now, what does the meditation sit in the middle of? Yeah, well, actually, those those three uh, those three dualities, mind and body, is another one actually. So that means in meditation we try to keep our mind in the middle, and the middle is the present moment. The middle is between the past is one extreme, the future is the other extreme. The present moment is in the middle, like the clock ticking. Right? What happens when the clock stops stops ticking? in the middle, Bandhu. The clock is in the middle. Time stops. Okay. So when our mind is held in the middle, it stops thinking about past and future. It's only when we allow it to keep moving between uh, the past and the future. Like you feel a pain and you remember the past. Oh, I had that pain. It was horrible. And I, and I, I, wanna, I, I don't want to continue into the future. And so we're creating this uh, time. Anyway, so the past and future. And then pleasure and pain. The mind is always going toward pleasure or trying to go away from pain. So... In meditation, we try to keep our mind in the middle. And then also between the body and mind. I didn't mention that before, but uh, thanks for reminding me. Yeah. The body and mind. We treat those as dualities too. Oh, this is my body, this is my mind. And, uh, but in reality, just as with the baby in the womb, they were fused together. They were intimately connected. Because consciousness or the mind basically went into every cell, at least the awareness. And after nine months, there's billions of cells in the body and they're all connected in a web. Actually, we ever looked at the, the nervous system of a body in the pictures or in these exhibits, you know, you know every cell of the body, every part of the body is, you know, has got these uh, delicate nerves and they're all intertwined like a spider web. And the spider web is actually a very good analogy for the, the nervous system. And they're all connected. So if you feel something in your toe, then, you know, the rest of the body uh, kind of knows what's happening, or at least signals go out. And of course, with the immune system, for example, you know, if you get a cut, that sends alarm signals out through the whole body and, you know, uh, all kinds of things bells and whistles are going off, you know, white blood cells are, are generated or whatever, and you can tell I'm not a doctor. <laughs> uh, but so all these uh, things are happening because they're interconnected. And the body has natural wisdom too. Look, nature created this body with its uh, immune system, that's a very good example of that. 
of the innate wisdom that the body has to keep itself alive. I mean, it's a very complicated organism, you know. All the different systems are interconnected. Breathing, the respiration, heartbeat, the lungs are so intimately connected, regulating each other. And everything else is, is all regulated. Uh, and so it's all interconnected. And there's natural wisdom that it grew by itself in the womb. You know, the most intricate, marvelous organism that we know of, as of yet, uh, you know, is human body. Is it? But did the IBM machine make it? Did a doctor make it? Out of two invisible little molecules of <laughs> DNA or whatever, we can't even see, somehow produced this, this body. So there's a lot of wisdom in that. There's a lot, a lot of knowledge, natural uh, knowledge. And it works very well, the body, if we don't interfere with it. But the problem is we've interfered with it. And now we don't know how to heal ourselves. So even if we get a little scrape or we get a little pain, we have to go to the doctor and ask the doctor what's wrong with us or, or how to heal ourselves. Where the ancient people, they figured that out uh, quite better without all these modern uh, gadgets and so on. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just saying that just to try to highlight this uh, idea that, you know, we have this natural wisdom, but we've lost touch with it because we've been disconnected from the body. And we start to do things that are harmful for the body. So if you're really in tune with the body, like animals are, they have a natural kind of wisdom, right? When they get sick, they know how to kind of just go out in the forest and lay low for a while or, you know, take, you know, all these exotic medicines. Of course, they may die, or, but they may, they may uh, come back to health. But anyway, they have this uh, natural kind of wisdom. But because they were more in the present moment and more in tune with themselves. But uh, we've lost that because we've been disconnected from the body. That means the present moment. So whenever I say the body, I mean the present moment. Because the body is always in the present moment. You know, just, you know, just feel your hand, sensations in your hand. That's, that's just happening in the, the present moment. Well, whatever posture it's in, it's just the present moment. And when you remember it and get in touch with it, then the mind gets uh, flipped back onto its channel of present moment awareness. Uh, and whenever you're lost in the thoughts of past or future, that's what produces anxiety, worry, fear, doubts, and so on. But whenever you sit in, in able to stay in the present moment, then, uh, you know, if you're able to hold it at least for a, a couple of minutes or so, then you start to feel quite uh, okay. You know, you start to feel you know, pleasant feelings arising and you feel very sort of comfortable. And even though there might be pain still going on, the mind is no longer you know, uh, getting so disturbed by it, you can be able to tolerate the pain longer is because you're holding the mind in the present moment longer with your con object of concentration or just the flow of present moment uh, awareness. And so the you know, the, the living process, uh, you know, really that's, 
you know, beginning to understand what life is. Life is the flow of the present moment vibrations through uh, the senses and how we react to these uh, feelings, the pleasant and painful feelings or the thoughts of the past or the future or even the, the thoughts of I and the other. As soon as we get caught up and cling to those ideas, then that's when we triggers off so many other types of emotions and then uh, reactions. <clears throat> and meditation is also, uh, you know, that's why we actually uh, call uh, meditation in the Dharma language, we call it the, the medicine. So meditation comes from the same root as medicine, but in the Dhamma, the meditation is the medicine. That means keeping the mind grounded and centered in the present moment long enough is a healing power. Because the sickness comes from being out of harmony with the flow of nature and trying to resist and getting caught between uh, pleasure and pain and then doing things that disturb the natural uh, equilibrium by doing things that, you know, consuming things out of pleasure, consuming things that are harmful for us. Uh, or, uh, you know, anger and other emotions uh, causing, you know, their own psychosomatic reactions and so on. So that the meditation itself is a healing process to heal. Actually, disease in the Dhamma language is uh, dis-ease. We call it disease, right? but it's spelled as dis-ease. It's very interesting. You know, we say disease, that's just virus, you know, like some foreign thing that come into us. Okay, it's true that they might have those things, but in a Dhamma language, the disease is dis-ease. That means not being at ease. And that means not being grounded in the present moment where there's not this tension of past and future and the worry, fear, anxiety, greed, or hatred that goes along with the past and the future. So the longer we can keep the mind grounded in the present moment, just focused on the breathing, or just, you know, being centered in the, in the body, just you know, with the, the flow of sensations, but without trying to react uh, and change them. Without holding on to our, our thoughts of, of the past and future, then uh, that uh, acts as a, a healing, a healing process that uh, comes about. Because the the mind is now in more harmony with the laws of nature and the laws of nature means the natural present moment awareness and the natural wisdom that comes with that. So, uh, you know, another example of how, you know, our mind can be our worst enemy. In fact, there's a Dhammapada verse, you know, more than a, the suffering, pain and suffering that a, a foreign army can do to you or some outside persons can inflict on you, your mind can inflict more pain on yourself. <clears throat> so, uh, 
So like the example of a young person, they start smoking when they're young, maybe because of peer pressure and so on. I'm talking from my own experience and so on, you know. Somebody says, oh, I tried a cigarette, you know, it's cool, you know, it'd be cool, you know. Look like James Dean or somebody, you know. Look like Eddie Van Halen, you know. Uh, oh, I suppose a cigarette and a guitar, you know. So anyway, so out of innocence, we start smoking, but then you get the, you know, you get addicted to it. And then, uh, you know, you start coughing. <clears throat> so the body's trying to tell you something, right? Because it has natural wisdom. But then we get so attached to our opinions and our ideas. Cigarettes can just be an example of any addiction to anything else. Your anger, your attachments, your pride, your conceit, or whatever it is. Your viewpoints, religious dogmas, political beliefs. But anyway, so you, uh, the body is trying to tell you something. But then the mind, you know, you, know, you, you start to get, light up a cigarette. The body is trying to tell you, you know, unconsciously, don't do that, don't do that. But the mind says, shut up. Right? And then down the road, it causes us uh, problems. Because we've lost that natural connection to uh, that state of equilibrium that we've, we've, you know, developed all these kind of addictions. Anyway, I don't want to belabor the point, but, uh, but it's an important aspect of understanding. And that's why the meditation practice and, and understanding really the, the, the living process of learning how to, you know, is to become centered, reconnected to the body. Because look at the, the body is always with us. The body is the only thing that we have that's with us from the moment we die into the moment, uh, excuse me, from, from the moment we're born to the moment we die, right? We have this body that's with us every second. Of course, it may be changing, but the fact that the body itself is here. And it's just beneath our nose, just, yeah, body. Your mother and father don't stay around your whole life. Your brother and sisters don't stay around your whole life. Your aunts and uncles, relatives don't stay around your whole life. Your cats and dogs and other things that you've had since you were born don't stay around with you your whole life, right? Your friends or boyfriends or wives or whatever, uh, they also, some do, maybe a few, but what I'm getting at is that, you know, everything else comes and goes for our life, but our body is our only true friend. The body is the only thing that we have with us our whole life until death. It's always there, inviting you, come home, please. Come on, come home. Stop that bar hopping and all sort of junk. You know, come home. Come back to the present moment. It's begging you. And it's your only true friend. It won't let you down unless you let it down. Of course, getting old is no one's going to stop that, but that's not letting it down, understanding that old age, disease, and death is a natural process of life. We will talk about the birth and death at another time. Uh, but anyway, so I just wanted to, uh, to, I know you've heard this before, but just to re- uh, focus on that, especially during a time of retreat where you have all this time available to actually try to get, you know, reconnected to it and to try to at least taste what is met by 
uh, present moment awareness. Most people have no idea, present moment awareness, what the hell is that, you know? No one ever talks about it. But it's a, ta a very tangible reality. Or not something you can touch, but, you know, that's directly, uh, you know, perceivable within uh, the consciousness. So anyway, that's what we're going to try to uh, continue to uh, uh, work on in our meditation practice. And that's also, again, just a reminder about how the, the yoga is important for that, because uh, you know, in the yoga, you're spending that whole period of yoga, basically keeping your mind uh, connected in the body. And why can't people feel their bodies? You know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't feel my body. I think I mentioned this already, until they stub their toe or cut their finger down, and they're brought back to their body. Or even if they're not cutting themselves, I've asked people before, you know, say, if you, you know, can you feel anything in the body? Well, I, I think so. You know, <laughs> you know I, I felt this pain. But there's billions of cells that are all vibrating all the time within the body and they can be felt. It's not a joke. It's not pie in the sky. But you have to tune your attention to it. And the yoga helps to enhance that because when you're doing the exercises and you're doing the breathing, that's what activates the cellular vibrations with more amounts of oxygenated blood because that's the fuel for our cells. It's, you know, the oxygen that, and the life force that comes out to them. But most people don't breathe very deeply. And their lungs are kind of shriveled up and they have a very short breath. Uh, and that's why you have to breathe quicker because our lungs are, have been shriveled up or because of other impurities in the lungs or just the, the muscles of the lungs and the rib cage are not have been exercised so they're not uh, flexible so people can you know that's about all people have is an in-breath you know. but being able to Take a deep, slow breath and hold the breath in a few seconds. Because holding the breath in longer allows more time for all the oxygen to get out of the lungs into the bloodstream. Uh, and that helps to slow down the mind. The mind and breathing are related. The quicker you breathe, normally the more active uh, the mind is. And uh, the more slowly you Breathe. Well, you get more oxygen in one breath, you get more oxygen into the system. So therefore, the rate of your breathing slows down. The body can only use so much oxygen. But if you don't breathe much in in the first place, you have to keep breathing faster to supply all the cells of the body. And also when you think that uses up a lot of oxygen too. Thinking uses a lot of oxygen. The brain uses more oxygen even than lifting weights, probably. The doctors probably can tell you that. Uh, so when your thinking slows down and your body movements slow down, the need for oxygen goes way down. Or if you take a deep, slow breath, you get more oxygen than you normally would in taking three or four breaths. But that helps to relax and calm the nervous system. Okay, so I think maybe uh, that might be enough for this talk. And uh, so if any of you have any questions about any of that, then you can write those down for the you know, questions and answers session. And tonight, those who are listening in on the virtual web, uh, 
you may not get a chance to ask questions because we're not doing that during this uh, these web broadcasts. It's uh, too complicated. So <clears throat> anyway, we're going to take a little short break now to stand up. And if you need to urgently use the restroom, then we'll try to mindfully don't run, but uh, you know, mindfully do that. Come back in a few minutes, and we'll do a standing awareness meditation and a few uh, uh, stretches uh, before we uh, sit again. During the whole life, we've been accumulating a lot of karma based on our understanding and accumulating many habits. You're a good angel. Uh, all those habits, basically, they're a lot of disturbance. So all, all the habits and so on that we've accumulated our whole life, they're called sankaras, part of the five aggregate sankara kind of. But anyway, it's, it's like a powerful energy, these habits, because these habits of the mind, you know, and, and, and in the mind, the sankaras, you know, they can create the atom bomb, and, you know, destroy the worlds, and it's all through the mind. So. Uh, it's a powerful energy. We can create something like that. We're going to send rocket ships you know, up to Mars and things like that. That's all from mental energy. You know, so, anyway. So, when a person dies, these strong habits, it's a magnetized energy. And so, it's, it seeks out a place to continue because it's, it's just the, the nature of this. Uh, force of consciousness that has is driven by uh, some cars and by greed, hatred, and delusion. <clears throat> because to think that when you death, all these accumulate, you know, you could, a person with a lot of rage, right? It's a person raging, hatred, and everything else. You think at the time of death, that's just going to go poof and disappear? You know, that's not logical. Uh, although people will say it, is, but sure, there's debates around it. You know, about, but anyway, according to the Buddhist uh, idea about the rebirth, so this consciousness seeks out, and it's like a magnetic attraction. So it, the, the idea, the term "descent into the womb." means this consciousness is released in this body and according to some it might uh, kind of just hang out for a while uh, until it uh, <clears throat> finds a suitable place to be, uh, to be reborn. But anyway, whether it's immediately or if there's some, uh, some interval in between is not really that important. But anyway, the descent into the womb in the consciousness uh, is attracted and into another womb, although it doesn't have to be a womb, it could be spontaneously re reborn in a deva realm, it could be born in an animal body in a womb, or a human, depending on the karma, of course. So it's basically, it's just like a magnetic attraction. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can't really describe exactly how it, you know, there's no proper words or anything. Like that exactly describe how it, or why that process happens. But, yeah, it's just like, like attract, like attracts, uh, like, you know, if a person's mind is filled with uh, hatred or he was used to killing, uh, let's say, animal butchers and so on, they 
you might be attracted to them or, you, uh, or a place where it will match that the vibration of their mind uh, at the time that they die. But the way you live at the time you die, that the sum total of all that is a kind of magnetized energy. It's attracted to a place that will provide the type of future environment where it can act out that and it can reap the, the results of that, that karma that had been accumulated. And how does it re relink after, after death? Again, I want to just kind of mention that. It's not easy to answer that. But actually, I like to give the uh, analogy of a cell phone to describe the process of rebirth. Some people say, well, how can the mind just, you know, find the, the right place that it should be reborn? Well, let's say you have a cell phone in your pocket. And you want to call your friend in India, halfway around the world. And he's got his cell phone in his pocket. Maybe he's in a big sporting event, or maybe he's in a big crowd of you know, half a million or a million people. And you pull out your cell phone and you punch in nine or twelve numbers. And then an invisible energy leaves that your phone, and within a matter of a few seconds, travels halfway around the world to find that exact phone out of a million other phones that are all within the space of a football field, maybe, or whatever, you know, finds that. To me, that's more difficult to understand than reboot, how that can happen. So if it can happen like that, then this mind, when it leaves this body, is the same, same kind of energy, probably as the cell phone energy. It's just, a, it's just a magnetic vibration. And it matches up with uh, the similar vibration. So this person's number in, in India and finds that. And so, you know, you, you have to have an area when you, when you phone somebody, you have to have an area code, right? And every country has its own uh, Country code, right? So what was India? 71. 91. 91. Sri Lanka is 77. America's number one. Anyway, so the area code is sort of like the human realm or the animal realm, or the deva realm, or the hell realm, or the heaven realm. So these have their own area code. That means a certain vibration that will attract energy to it. And if the mental energy accords with that kind of energy in that place, it could be attracted there. But, you know, thousands of people are born in the human realm. So to get a human birth requires a certain type of karmic uh, mm -hmm. vibration. But then the individual is the individual's number. So you might be born in, in a certain country, but yet, but also you're born to a particular family and so on. So anyway, that's just, a, I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway, it uh, makes more sense than just saying, well, it just happens by chance or, you know, somebody wants it that way or whatever. Okay. So. Is the underlying awareness that means perceiving the five aggregates and the permanence, is that the changeless, deathless state? Uh, well, you know, I've, I've been mentioning that uh, a few times in our practice. That, you know, it's the five aggregates 
or what make up the body, mind, world, and all the sensory vibration belongs to those five aggregates, material aggregate. You know, sound, smells, taste, vibrations that are floating around. I mean, you're sitting here and you're, some odor might be floating around and some food. That's a vibration. It's an odor vibration. When it tastes something on the tongue, certain tastes, it's a taste vibration. And so, uh, you know, you got all these vibrations. In meditation, it's, you can feel the bodily vibration, but it's consciousness. Normally, it's our consciousness that perceives them, but underlying the consciousness. I mean, I, I, I usually make, um, to, to kind of make it a little bit more understandable, and just kind of simplify it. You know, there's, I make a distinction between consciousness and awareness. So consciousness is usually what we consider the subject object uh, duality. I am hearing this sound. I am feeling this. So the consciousness of the, the ordinary person you know, has the sense of I, uh, mind, and it, it's usually reacting to these objects. It sees everything as a specific object. So that's when you become conscious of something. But awareness is the more expanded uh, mind of the, uh, like when, when the baby was born, as I mentioned, this more oceanic awareness. It doesn't have that solidified ego nucleus so much with as many degrees of that. So in meditation, that nucleus of the heart, ego, I, me, mind, uh, begins to dissolve. And when it dissolves, then that's when you feel like the consciousness is kind of getting uh, larger because that's that sense of I, me, and mind and the clinging which contracts it, contracts it around itself. But when that clinging is uh, not so strong, then the sense of the I is, uh, you know, <coughs> fades away, then more space comes into the uh, consciousness. That's what I like to call you know, awareness. Mm -hmm. So awareness is a more, it's, it's still consciousness, but it's a, it's a different quality of it. There's no more long ego along with it, you know? So, uh, and there's many degrees of that. Of course, the, the change of depth of state would be that state in the highest degree, but we can experience many other degrees that may be not the, the true deathless state, but uh, degrees of that where that we can kind of get a, a, a taste of what that would be like. So yeah, the underlying awareness is when you're able, you have a good detachment from the aggregates and you're able to just be aware of you know, physical sensations and, you know, the thoughts coming and going, but there's this kind of uh, underlying kind of stillness, especially when like when there's pains, you have a lot of itches and stinging, biting sensations on your legs and pains. But even in spite of that, there's a, a sense of some stillness there. So that is that awareness. It's the mental space that's not being disturbed by any of these uh, impermanent passing phenomena. That's why I got the best way I can you know, try to uh, explain. But it's something you definitely can experience. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, there's a, the process of the mind involved in that. And I'll try to talk more about that tomorrow. Is the purpose of meditation or concentration to see 
intention of the mind. His intention in aggregate. Well, intention belongs to, uh, you know, intention is a, is a, is an urge, like an urge. You, know, you, you feel a painful feeling and then you see this urge and this aversion to it. And then that urge to want to get away from it. And then, and then you have to have an intention to lift your arm, for example, if you want to scratch. The intention to lift your arm you have to be there. Otherwise, the arm is not going to lift by itself. So the mental intention, yes, that belongs to the samkara kanda. Mm -hmm. Intentions, deliberate intention. You have the idea to do something and then you do it. Mm -hmm. There's a process involved. Usually it's based on a pleasant or painful feeling and then the intention to either get it because of desire, intention to you want to get it, or if it's painful feeling, the intention you want to push it away. But then the body is the one, you know, basically what has to do that. Uh, so it causes the body to do its actions. Um, so yes, one of the purposes of the Pasana meditation, especially, is to observe the uh, these urges and intentions so that you can directly see the mind because the intention is one of the subtlest impulses of the nervous system. But normally we don't see the intentions. That's why walking meditation and movement meditation is one of the best practices for deliberately forcing the intention up uh, because the body's not going to walk without the intention. So especially when you, you walk slowly and you put pauses between your activities. And when we're doing things fast, like, you know, like, you know, we, can't, we can't really, I mean, there's a general sense of, yes, you're doing something, but you're not really seeing each intention clearly. And for each even microscopic movement of the body, there's a different intention. So that's why I, when I teach walking meditation, I, I teach it in this way where you try to feel this, these five phases of the walking process. The lifting of the foot is one intention. Swinging it forward requires different muscles, so that it's a different intention. And the intentions arise and vanish, followed by another one that arises and vanishes. So the lifting intention causes the foot to lift. Then the intention to swing it forward engages different muscles. The intention to lower the foot heel to the floor is a, is a different movement. The intention to shift the body forward is a different intention. And like that. You know, lifting your arm, the intention to lift, the intention to move it this way, the intention to move it this way. That's why the deliberate uh, movement, body movement uh, awareness is very powerful at uh, seeing the intentions. But you have to move slowly enough. If you do it too quickly, you won't see. So it's a very deliberate type of practice. Uh, that you do, it's a training in the beginning, but later uh, you don't have to move so clearly, but you'll still see the intention. But that's directly seeing the mind. Uh, and so if you can be aware of your intentions, like even now when I'm speaking, I can see the intention to move the lips to form different syllables. But and when you can see the intentions of even very minute body movements, like even just, you know, wiggling your fingers and, or blinking, 
see the intention to blink. We blink many times during the day, we, but we never see the intention to blink. But if you pause, you force the intention up. Because you, know, you want to walk, but yet if you don't see the intention, you can't walk. So you wait until you see the intention and then you take the step. So like that, it's a kind of a training. But when you can see that, then you can see the intention for random things that arise, not the deliberate type of thing. And sometimes it'll actually shock you. It, it arises kind of almost with a flash. You know, sometimes it's very really, uh, almost shocks you. To, have, to actually see a thought pop right up into the mind you know, or an intention, like a flashbulb going on. <clears throat> so, I mean, of course, the purpose of doing that is seeing how you know, this the mind is conditioned and this impermanence, how quickly these impulses come and go. Uh, this, this question is a bit more difficult. Yeah. What kind of material form supports consciousness after physical death? Well, that's hard to answer. You know, that's not going to get in all the Abhidharma terms and so on. So, but uh, actually, you know, this, you know, a person can be reborn in a deva realm. There's material form in a deva realm, but it's not this kind of material form. It's, fine material form, made of light and so on. So there's different types of material forms that can support, support consciousness. And there's even a realm that doesn't even have any material form. Weird, but I, I don't want to get into this, it's too complicated. Don't make life too complicated. Right? We'll try to figure it out exactly. Because only the Buddha has the kind of mind that can perfectly know. Okay. So is it just this one? Yes, Peter. So there's a question that came up on this, uh, on this Zoom chat uh, box. This uh, <coughs> says, the comment about animals following nature's rules, but humans fail to do so, could be because of higher human intelligence and analytical ability. Which goes against the rules. We suffer more than animals who it's, it's a little complicated. Uh, but what I meant by animals following nature's rules, I mean, it's just the nature of an animal body has different natures. So, you know, an animal nature is, you know, they're just, you know, they have the karma to be born as, a, as an animal. That means they don't have, a, let's say, yeah higher analytical intention or the e egos that the human realm uh, people have. And, you know, animals, they, you know, they, uh, <clears throat> they don't think much about the, you know, the future or the past, although they might a little bit. But, uh, you know, they don't, uh, you know, I suppose they do have greed and so on like that because there's instances of, of that in animals uh, too. But usually humans have 
because of the emotions and the ego is much stronger and the attachment and aversion, you know, you know like these you know, serial killers, probably in the animal world, you know, serial killers. You know, although you could say a cat is a serial killer, <laughs> you know, might go out and kill a snake, you know, and some, some other animals. So, uh, you know, there's that too. But, uh, you know, because of the human beings, uh, you know, that's some kinds of thing. And of course, we have the the wherewithal to mass kill, let's say, for example. So, um, you know, they're, they're following the human beings and their emotions are much stronger, like greed and hatred that will allow them to. And also, they have the means now because of technology <clears throat> to, you know, create things that can wipe out a thousand people one blow, you know, cook up a poison and then distribute it in a, in a lake or somewhere or whatever. So their uh, their egos are much more strong. And, you know, animals just seem just more natural you know, because they're out in nature. So Well, you know, animals, when they get sick and they die, they just die. But human beings don't want to die. They don't want to accept it. So they go to the hospital and have their body pasted and stitched together with plastic and nails and all kinds of things in order to live longer and uh, longer, even if they're in a, you know, if they know they're going to die, they want to live longer. That's not natural. Yeah. Um, especially when it goes to some of those extremes, you know, and then they suffer you know, on account of that. You know. They're de denying the reality of old age. Let's put it that way. There's examples of it, right? So when animals get old, they don't dye their hair, they don't get cosmetic surgery. The people do, right? So, so they're not they're not following the nature's rules of improvement. So when the body starts getting old and, and things, let it be. But no, we want to dye our hair so we we'll fool ourselves that we're not getting old. So we should dye the color. And, uh, and, and all those things I already mentioned. So that that is one example of how we're kind of living out of sync with the laws of, of nature. Uh, not accepting the reality of change and permanence. Okay. Um, and then once, and once you realize that you can't deny sickness and death anymore, and then then people, you know. Uh, suffer even more by you know, denying that, living in the illusion that uh, they're still uh, young and so on. Or they're not uh, happy with their looks, so they you know, go to these extremes of so many you know, types of ways to change their look. Because I would just impress somebody, some animals. I haven't heard of any animals being cosmetic surgery or something like that. Or this is some animal owners that might want to, <laughs> might attempt to do that. They do, right? Actually, they cut their dog's hair and dye it to all kind of color and make it uh, unnatural. But that's the human being doing that. It's not a dog doing that. Anyway, that's. Uh, that's uh, but they, people okay. spend uh, thousands and thousands of dollars on facelifts and, <laughs> you know, just to stay looking young, uh, although that thing works maybe only for a few months and all those thousands of dollars are gone down the drain.
ultimately you can't fight you can't fight your you're, you're right you know ultimately you have to accept uh, the laws of nature like even my mother she wanted to die actually yes but she couldn't so she had to live for 102 years but her body was like a prison so she was also i mean she had by default she would accept it but and so some people don't want to die others uh, you know want to die uh, but uh, the way of the Dhamma is just to let nature take its course. If you have the karma to live order, then for some reason you're going to live order. If you have the karma to get some disease or die in an accident when you're younger, well, then that also happens. Every single being in the world is totally unique. It was not, you know, out of the billions and billions of people, who, you know, been recycling, you know, over the last uh, thousands of years, but not not any one of them was totally the same, you know, in every aspect of their life and mind and thoughts. Right. Um, and even identical twins, they're, they're still all, even though know, they might be identical in many ways, not but you know, all the things that make them different. So, you know, that's all because of the differences in the comment. Okay, I think we'll wind up this. So. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, uh, go ahead and stand up. Yeah. So, standing meditation before starting on sitting. Feel the feet pressing the floor, standing body. And some three part breathing, deep, slow breathing. With the, with the deep, slow breathing, the idea behind it is to gradually train your lungs to be able to you know, breathe slower and also to be able to hold the air in longer and after the in-breath and after breathing out to have a longer pause before the need to breathe in uh, again. In other words, to slow down the rate of respiration from the normal 10 to 15 breaths a minute to just down to three or four or less. And it can be done, but it has a radical you know, effect on the nervous system. You know, it will really calm it down. 
shift the nervous system from the reactive mode into the parasympathetic mode, the more relaxed awareness. Do a few stretches, the energy, and the next in breath, arms over the head, interlock the fingers, stretch upward. In breath up on the toes, arms over the head.
knee bending, Dead turn left to left, reverse to the right.
Thank <laughs> you. 